I do want to introdu introduce our panel today. Um, we all know what's been going on with the anti apita violence that's been happening the last month, or specifically the, the last month, but really the past year. And a year ago, we went to CFA and said, these things are happening and we want to do something about it. And, you know, with the support of CRSJ, we were able to um, put together a video that Dr. Russell Jung was graciously willing to share his research and make this video also to have one of his graduate students take off um, or do a curriculum guide to it, which was really useful. So we really appreciate all that support. Today, we want to um, give some space to uh, Dr. Jung's uh, work uh, to give us an update on that. And then we also have Wei Ming uh, Dariotis, who uh, also from San Francisco State, who's done a lot of work um, in, in this area, but specifically about resources. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that we lack is I've had many of the, the officers and uh, heads of uh, caucuses contact me saying, hey, what can we do? How can we support you? Uh, what, how, what can we tell people to do? And William Ming has done a lot to gather resources and give us a way to do this. Um, so uh, to take action, to work together. So thank you also to all of you for your support support um, and kind words during this time, but just like any kind of racism that we, or ism that we experience in the United States, this is not the beginning. This may have been a wake up call a year ago and now again, a year later, but this kind of racism and exclusion has been happening ever since we've discovered difference or we've had outsiders, not really outsiders because we're all immigrants here, but people from other countries coming here. So with that, I will turn it over. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, CFA, for inviting me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Council on Social Justice that really supported me and the Asian Apita Caucus. Sadly, this is a real typical event of what's happened in the past year. And I've been hearing these stories countless times over um, after creating Stop API Hate. So again, this has been happening. Um, Stop API Hate, we've received over 3,800 incidents through February. And that was before we saw the attacks on the elderly and the Atlanta shootings. So now we're receiving a lot more reports as we get more widespread attention. Um, next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of what's happening, <clears throat> um, you can see there's four kinds of um, incidents we're receiving. They're not all hate crimes. So for we think the focus on hate crimes is actually misguided. It's sort of, um, we need to address racism before it gets to a hate crime level. Um, if you see on the bottom, 8% of our incidents are um, civil rights violations being mistreated at the workplace, 7% is online. Um, on the top, you could see the microaggressions that Asians are experiencing, verbal harassment. We're having a lot of racial epithets slung at us, a lot of profanities. We're also getting shunned and avoided at high rates. We found that one out of five Asian Americans who report racism are now displaying racial trauma. These are elevated symptoms of depression, anxiety, hypervigilance, and avoidance, the hallmarks of trauma. Um, our respondents over time are becoming increasingly angry because they over time realize the injustice perpetrated against them. They realize how demeaning and objectified they were treated and they get upset that America hasn't lived its ideals. So these aren't microaggressions. These experiences again are hate-filled tirades against people. And because we don't know where it's coming from, that's what makes it more um, difficult. Um, and you can see being coughed at and spat upon, facing physical assault, make up 18% of our cases. Um, again, it's because people see us as foreigners, as outsiders, that's why they're coughing and spitting on us because they think of us as not belonging. It's not because we're the model minority, it's because, again, the term China virus really racialized and stigmatized us as outsiders to be excluded. Okay, next slide. The impacts of this racism has been Horrific. And, you know, obviously we were grieving over the death of Atlanta. Um, 
we're outraged by what happens to, um, when we're violently attacked to our elders. And the, beyond the violence and the trauma, we're um, having other impacts. Next slide. Asian Americans are the racial group with the highest rates of mental health distress during the pandemic. And those who experience racism have even higher rates of depression, stress, anxiety, and somatic symptoms. Here's the takeaway point from our study. Asian Americans who experience racism, we ask them to rank their greatest fear during the pandemic. And their greatest fear overall is racism. Think about it. Asian Americans are more concerned about other Americans and their hate than they are about a pandemic that has killed half a million people. Asian Americans are more fearful of other Americans' hate than they are of a pandemic that has killed half a million people. That's how severe the racism is. That's how widespread the racism is. That's how traumatizing the racism is. That's how scary the racism is. And so um, be mindful of your students, um, how we're concerned about our elderly, how we're concerned about our younger siblings walking to school. We're under a state of siege right now. And so making sure that our um, Asian Americans are cared for, even your fellow CFA members, check in on your fellow Asian Americans and we need support and allyship. Okay, next slide. Asian Americans, because of racism, have the second highest rate of unemployment. It's because people were avoiding our small businesses, our restaurants, our nail salons. So our Asian American businesses closed even before quarantine. And we've had to lay off a lot of um, service sector working class Asian Americans. Okay, next slide. And being racialized as outsider, that became institutionalized in policies. So President Trump last year, he extended the Muslim ban. He stopped migration visas so families couldn't reunite. He banned Chinese scientists and researchers. He cut refugee resettlement. He cut H-1B visas. All these policies excluded Asians, disproportionately impacted, institutionalized that racism um, due to COVID-19. So the impacts have been severe. And yes, you could have um, access to these slides afterwards. Okay, so we see the impact. Next slide. Okay, thanks, Lisa. So we've really risen up. We've used our voice. And I think Asian Americans are being heard because this is a national issue. This is not an Asian American issue, national issue of violence and racism. It's not an Asian American issue. It's other people's issue with us. It's other people's racism. So that's why the president needs to address it. And you can see president has actually publicly spoken about it four times. In the last executive order, he incorporated three recommendations from Stop API Hate. So we've actually been meeting with the White House. We have been meeting with the attorney general. Um, so um, hopefully the more Asian Americans and our allies raise their voice, the more government is respond. That was our whole aim for Stop API Hate is to hold government accountable for the safety of the community. Next slide. And since then, it's really gone for, into a larger global movement. And um, I'd like to just really acknowledge that it was a student movement to start. Um, we've had <laughs> Stop the API Hate, we were, we had high school students help clean up our data, create our dashboards. We had college students help our reports. This was all volunteer. We had a youth campaign and the youth interviewed a thousand of their peers. They came up with their own policy report and their policy recommendations were introduced last year, um, last week by Congresswoman Grace Meng. She utilized their report to introduce ethnic studies curriculum funding. You can see we're hitting mainstream media, Sports Illustrated, a really good article. And we're getting corporate support. So Salesforce is, so now we've gone from having high school students helping us with our data. Now we have data scientists from Salesforce helping us with our data. And we've gotten so big that K-pop group BTS tweeted out, stop AAPI hate. That became a global, um, third most um, trending tweet in the world. So this is a grassroots movement. I think we started out of the student movement and started out of CFA. And again, I received 
um, real strong support from the Council of Racial and Social Justice, um, from the PETA caucus. And I tell everyone, um, be, be like CFA. That's what we need to do to act in solidarity. Be like CFA, who actually made the first official statements against racism. Be like CFA in working together to amplify our voice. So I just really thank CFA for helping be the start of this API movement, for furthering it, for educating our community, and for actually rallying. So yeah, I guess, like Nikki says, hashtag be like CFA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Russell. We so appreciate all your hard work. And finally, we'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Weiming Dariotis, who will talk about some resource for us. Thank Wei you. Um, so I am Weiming Dariotis. I'm a full professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State, which makes me one of only 2% of full professors who are Asian American women. Um, and I am the faculty director of CEDL, the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching and Learning, and a former CFA chapter president for my campus. I identify as a Chinese, Greek, Swedish, cisgender, bisexual, queer woman. I was born in Adelaide, Australia, in the land of the Kauruna Mayuna, and raised in San Francisco, where I currently live and work on the unceded territory and traditional home of the Rometush Ohlone people. I appreciate this indigenous tradition of land acknowledgements, which non-indigenous people have been being requested to honor for hundreds of years, because I am as ashamed of not having known as a child the names of Ohlone peoples, as I am of having teased my Chinese mother for her inability to say words like Palo Alto. I use the pronouns she, her, and sometimes the Chinese gender neutral pronoun ta, despite my imposter syndrome as someone who only studies Chinese as a way of reclaiming the mother tongue I once rejected. And I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the ways that we can work together to create an anti-racist university during the pandemic. Um, and my, I'm gonna kind of skim over the first couple slides just to say that uh, there's some context for doing this work. So a year, a little over a year ago, I created a Black Lives Matter solidarity statement for my unit for, the, for CETL um, in response to what was happening at that moment. And I'd like to say, you know, going into what's been happening recently i've been hearing a lot of units on campus whether and and, uh, and from other campuses as well um asking should we write our own solidarity statement or should we just rely on the one coming from the upper administration and to me a solidarity statement is the very least thing it's like a sympathy card it's the very least thing it's like saying hello back when somebody reaches out and says hello to you if you don't make a solidarity statement, then you can't do any of the other work that you need to do, the allyship act actions, okay? So I really want to encourage folks to think about a solidarity statement as the very first step. We started uh, last July um, a JEDI Institute, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in Online Pedagogies of Inclusive Excellence. We've now had over 400 SF State faculty and graduate teaching assistants certified uh, through this process. And the um, learning outcomes for the JEDI Institute are mostly around creating pedagogies, particularly for, we got money from CARES 2 Act, so it was focused on online teaching, but really the pedagogies transfer across to any kind of learning platform. We have 10 modules. Uh, it is a 25 hour training. Um, and the module that most people had challenges with were land acknowledgements. Uh, again, with the concern that, well, if it's just performative, should I really do it? And I have two answers to that. One, it's a tradition that we've been asked to participate in and ignored. Uh, so for that purpose alone, for that reason alone, we should do it. And then again, a land acknowledgement is a, the very base, it's the first step to doing any other kind of allyship action. Uh, similar to um, you know, making your pronoun declarations, being clear about your, your positionality, both personal and institutional, so that you're 
aware of power relationships as you work with folks. Okay. So all of that was happening. We created a newsletter, again, mostly drawing from our JEDI participants' posts and really trying to encourage, again, more anti-racist pedagogy across campus. I do the illustrations. I have my little gator in purple. And then um, in January, we were able to have an anti-racist university, how to be an anti-racist university as the theme of our faculty retreat, which we invited Chancellor Castro and our current president, um, Lynn Mahoney, to, um, to be the keynote speakers at, with the hope that they might feel the responsibility of having participated in this event moving forward. So the other part of the work that's just kind of happened um, that I've gotten drawn into is, I, would ca I call it Jedi University. And that is starting in 2019, um, I was invited by the School of Cinema uh, to help them develop a, an inclusivity statement. And this was actually started because as Russell described, as student initiated, the students in that school sent a petition to the faculty saying, we need to have more inclusivity. We feel excluded as people of color, as women. This is a really white dominated space. Um, please do something about it. And so the very first step was we, we did a workshop with them and they developed an inclusivity statement that they've got on their website and that faculty can include in their syllabi. And then it became the beginning of a series of ongoing workshops that I've done with them. The School of Music, which also has historically been extremely Eurocentric and, um, and uncomfortable for students of color, has created an EDI task force, which they've asked me, which I've been participating in. Even the Department of Geography, which you might not think would have these concerns, is looking at the history of racism within their own discipline and how they might address uh, the lack of diversity in their students and their faculty. The College of Science and Engineering, their college uh, joined us for a, um, for a, a long workshop and, and are doing continuing work through their anti-racism task force. Again, the School of Engineering, not a place that I would necessarily expect, but some of the faculty had come through our Jedi Institute and they said, we need to do something. And so they've actually started consulting with me and are creating their own internal task force and the English department um, recently also. So there are places where this is happening. Now I have to say, you might notice that this would be the work that a campus diversity director or AVP of diversity might be doing. We don't really have that. We have somebody in student affairs who has that title, but our campus doesn't have this. In fact, the response I've often gotten from administrators is, well, we're doing okay. We're doing better than other places, which is not true. Or we wouldn't be the most litigious campus in the CSU system. Recently, um, I can go back to this a little bit, but after the Atlanta shootings, I started to reach out to faculty across campus and I, I combed our websites for the names uh, and the email addresses of all the Asian American uh, and Pacific Islander and Asian women uh, and female identified people. Um, uh, faculty and staff and um, and I and I sent out a, a group email to everybody. I just tried to reach out to them um, and invited them to co-collaborate on a resource, which I'll share with you momentarily. But in that communication, I also called out some of the images um, that I had seen in our, in our campus. And one of them was the College of Liberal and Creative Arts Department's homepage had a multiple images of that demonstrated white supremacy, white men in, um, you know, superior positions in Asia, especially Asian women in, um, you know, subjected positions, and also images of kind of Asian American, like or Asian women in model minority positions and Asians as perpetual foreigners, all juxtaposed together telling a nice, neat little story that I might expect anybody trained in semiotic analysis, like the folks in that college to be able to analyze, but they didn't. 
CETL uh, has recently partnered with our department, Asian American Studies, on a JEDI web redesign project. So we're going to be the pilot department for redesigning our departmental web page through a JEDI lens in order to create a model that can be used in consultations with every department across campus to reframe their websites as a pedagogy tool to create a, a greater feeling of inclusiveness and belonging for their students. Okay. So again, right after the Atlanta uh, shootings, feeling like many of you very um, helpless, I went to my happy place, which is collaboration and creation. And so I sent out a Google Doc that I kind of created a framework for. I said, let's create a teaching guide for teaching in days after anti-AAPI violence. And that's what this link is. It takes you to a Google Doc that is still open and you can still contribute to it. And then um, I partnered with um, CETL, my, my office, to create um, a web page based on that guide. And actually, my team really stepped up in this moment, and they did the work of writing the solidarity statement without me, and then just had me come and check it to take some of the labor off of me. And I mean, my boss, my AVP, and three staff people of various uh, racial backgrounds gathered together, and they, the web designer, the content manager, and the communications director, and they wrote all of this out. Um, and put it together to be in a really, you know, digestible format. We've got educational resources looking at the history of anti-Asian racism from the past to the present. Um, we have links, of course, to Russell's resources for Stop AAPI Hate. And we've been continuing to modify it in response uh, to things that we've been getting from folks, including a request that we really call out, like that a lot of this is about Asians as, as foreigners, right? So uh, some of our Asian international colleagues and students said, we really need to be recognized because we sometimes get disappeared as Asian international people under the AAPI category. Um, looking at uh, Asian American um, destigmatizing mental health, and then allyship, advocacy, and activism. So really trying to create uh, a lot of detail. And it's you you pop these open, and there are um, you know lots of detail going on in here, including um, videos and things that are created by SF State students and faculty, uh, and other resources. We're also, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, Russell did a really good job of, of showing us how all of this violence happens outside. But what I'm saying is actually a lot of this violence happens inside, meaning inside our universities. In fact, um, because I sent this message out in, on a, like a mass list, I've gotten a lot of um, replies back from our colleagues. And uh, one of them shared with me this week that, her department was planning on doing a solidarity statement, but her own experience with like racism and bullying as an Asian American woman in her department made her angry that they were even talking about doing a solidarity statement without fixing the stuff or even addressing the problems that she's brought up before. She has no allies because people have either left the, the unit or are too afraid to say anything. And this is not an uncommon story. I've been hearing this across the campus and actually from people on other CSU campuses as well, that they have no place, no safe space in which to share their frustrations. So we've just recently started an AAPI, uh, um, actually an APIDA, um, faculty and staff association at SF State, and we're hosting a forum. But it feels like just a drop in the bucket because 
we can share and talk amongst ourselves, but our voices are not being heard by the upper administration and nothing is really being done to change things. Until we create our own systems of um, uh, to make change. And so one of those has been on our campus, a teaching effectiveness assessment task force, which I'm chairing because we cannot change the behavior of racism within classes unless we change the mechanisms of assessment. So we're working on a model of teaching effectiveness assessment that really foregrounds anti-racist pedagogy. Um, I also wanted to call out uh, why I mentioned that I'm one of 2% of Asian American women who are uh, full professors, that is because we have a drop off of um, two thirds down from the 6% of Asian American women who are assistant professors. There's a huge drop off. White women have a small drop off, but Asian American women have this extreme drop off from 6% to 2%. And that I think is because of the extreme um, micro, meso, and macro aggressions that we are experiencing within academia including uh, cultural taxation, um, hyperfeminization leading to um, uh, sexual harassment and bullying, and of course the presumed incompetence associated often with accents and race. What we can do as universities um, is to number one, disaggregate data debunk the myth that Asian Americans are overrepresented in academia, end the categorization of Asians as non-URMs or non-underrepresented minorities, which is the way the CSU categorizes us. That's, I put in the yellow box, the things that are for Asian and Asian American and Pacific Islander Americans. For everybody, we can track hiring and RTP data by race and gender by college on each campus. We can conduct exit surveys of those who separate from the university to find out why they're leaving. We can compensate and value those who experience cultural taxation, which the CFA 2020 equity report does a really good job of laying out in detail. We can redefine leadership inclusively and support leadership development, particularly for BIPOC faculty. We can examine public images across the university for racism and white supremacy and create anti-racist image checks. And we can create vigorous anti-bias, I'm uh, sorry, bias incident and harassment reporting structures and training and systems of reparations. We don't really have that. We have Title IX reporting structures, but we do not have what we need um, to end racism on our campuses. Okay. I'm done. Thank you so much, Wei Ming. I know that this has been um, a lot of your heart and soul, and we really appreciate uh, all of this work. And I, um, again, want to um, thank the, the Council for Social and Racial Justice for supporting this and the Executive Board of CFA 